It's now my pleasure to introduce R Lorraine Kipiotis, who is, um, she holds a Master of Arts degree from the University of Sydney in Renaissance Studies, and is currently engaged in a, doc um, a PhD in art history at the University of Sydney, with a strong focus on the function of artifacts within art academies and institutions. Her research interests also include women in art, museology and 19th century Australian art history. And Lorraine is also a frequent and popular guest as a lecturer at the Art Academy of New South Wales, as well as a regular guest on ABC Radio National's Nightlife program. She's going to speak to us today, and I can't wait. The title is Cast Away, David Washed Ashore in the Antipodes. Please welcome Lorraine Kipiotis. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Alison. Um, I'm very excited to hear that you worked with uh, Anne Galboli because, of course, the Victorian Library collection was uh, produced by the same maker as our cast, Bruciani, a London formatore. Um, last week, Georgina, Molly, and uh, Priya asked me which object I would like, to, which cast I'd actually like to bring in today. And it was a bit like asking me which was my favourite child. Luckily, I only have one child, don't have to choose there. But I thought I would take us back to 16th century Florence, because you may recognise some of these objects, of course, from the Medici tombs in San Lorenzo, and others as the features of Michelangelo's David. Um, or, if you're an art school alumni or student, you'll recognise this as a, probably a still life from one of our drawing classes or possibly sculpture modelling class. So please, Feel free to sketch as I talk, just in case it gets a little bit boring. <laughs> I'm actually going to pass this one around because these are objects to be used and to be touched. So uh, these are the lips of David, and I dare say this is the closest any of you will ever get to stroking the mouth of Michelangelo's David. <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on it. I'm, wait, wait. This is my joke for the day. I'm keeping an eye on it, so <laughs> be careful with it. To view the fragments of the facial features of Michelangelo's David in the cast collection of the National Art School is someone like considering the curious pieces of flotsam and jetsam washed ashore after a tropical storm. They have become in so many ways castaways adrift on an island continent. As for David himself, he may also have washed ashore sometime in the past, but alas, we have no record of this happening. If it were the case, then he's gone missing, perhaps wandered off into the bush, as did so many of our early settlers, never to be seen again. But how did his eyes, ears, nose and lips find their way to the National Art School? In the late 19th century, at a time when the cultural influence of classical learning was still strong, the National Art School, or as it was known then, the Department of Art, purchased plaster casts from the renowned London formatore, or plaster modeler, Bruciani and Company. The plaster casts have been here at the art school, so for much of its history, silent witnesses to the development of systemised art education in Sydney. They are part of a collection that once numbered in the hundreds. Unfortunately, only about 20 or so complete casts, some of which you see here today, have survived into this century. Amongst them, of course, are the separate features of David's face. These casts of the nose, mouth and eyes, alas, the ears have also gone missing, of Michelangelo's David were used to train and still are used to train students to think in three dimensions, working from the isolated components of the face to the bust and onto the whole human figure as the foundation of artistic practice. By now you're familiar with the National Art School, with its history that dates back to at least 1873, when the newly established Sydney Technical College incorporated a Department of Art. It developed at a rapid rate and outgrew its premises twice, finally finding a home here in Darlinghurst Jail in 1922. A newspaper of the day documents the transformation of the premises from house of correction to school, reporting that where there were formerly silence and tears are now the hum and joy of learning, and classes in art are now in progress. A photo documents the repurposing of one of the cell blocks into a drawing studio, where a class is shown drawing from the many casts which were on hand at the time. You'll notice, actually, uh, Michelangelo's uh, dying slave just over to the left there. 
Unfortunately, not long after, as was the case with many collections globally, academic attitudes regarding their significance changed. From the 19th century, when the copying of sculpture was essential to the dissemination of the pedagogic, two pedagogic and moral ideals, to complete disparagement by the mid 20th century. Many of these cars, as I've mentioned, have long since disappeared or been destroyed. But in their heyday, in their 19th century, they were considered essential for art education and appreciation. One of the major functions of the cast in the 19th century was to convey art historical knowledge and appreciation to those who could not travel abroad to see the works firsthand. There was also a great market for these copies as a way of transmitting not only the academic tradition from antiquity via the Renaissance, but also transmitting ideals of taste. Within an art school, their context of course goes much of their function goes beyond this. Certainly, art schools purchased casts because they were examples of the most beautiful statues, but rather than objects meant only for display as illustrations of the historic development of art, they were also didactic tools for the use of students and staff. Unlike museum collections that display casts as valuable and untouchable objects for the edification of the public, these are objects that one can also handle and touch. In an institution such as the National Art School, there's a distinct relationship between these inanimate objects and the students and staff who interact with them regularly. The casts are brought to life, so to speak, each time that they are taken from the storeroom to the studio. Further to this, the casts also take on a different meaning with each tableau that they're staged in. The manner and mode of display, of course, is a movable feast. The way in which the students interact with them, perceive them, stand around them and share their personal space differs each time. This of course is in opposition to the static nature of a museum display where the statue or object is restricted both in its manner of display and in the distance and boundaries which separate it from the viewer. The student in an art school of course has more freedom and is able to connect with the object. When, when, when one moves these casts away from the formality and grandeur of a museum setting, a deeper connection with the object is formed. One may observe a statue in a museum and connect with it visually and psychologically, but one may never touch it. The casts in an art school are even occasionally dropped in transit or unintentionally damaged beyond repair. This is Michelangelo's dying slave, of course. We can cry about these fatalities, but in general, we must accept that our casts are part of a working collection. They are objects to be used. Via this haptic connection and interaction between object and human, the art school has become the repository of a collection whose inherent value and significance lie not only in its historical and social context and its aesthetic values, of course, but also in the cast's function as useful object in a working collection. The casts are used, sometimes abused, handled, and sometimes even drawn upon. The plaster casts have certainly been marked by time and by the students who have left traces and scars and rough edges on the works. Take, for example, the uh, reduction cast of Michelangelo's figure of dust from the Medici tombs. It's actually covered in charcoal dust from the decades that it's been part of the, uh, the drawing classes. And the charcoal dust has become so embedded that you can't actually clean it off without damaging the plaster. Similarly, um, here in the David's eye, this is, this is actually from the sculpture department. Both the drawing and sculpture departments have these facial features. And in fact, the clay has also become embedded into the plaster from years and years of sculpture students actually making their own cast. And I'm sure some of you here have actually gone through that process. <laughs> Certainly, as Walter Benjamin posited, it is the existence of an object at a particular time and place, as well as traces left on that object by its passage through time, that make it unique and give it authority. And let us not forget that artifact study is also all about unlocking meanings. In order for us to do this, we must move between the experience of the object and the reason for the object's existence. Within a 19th century paradigm, the pedagogical and moral dimensions of a sound training in art were thoroughly enmeshed. Educators in Europe, and indeed in Australia, argued that art as a moralising influence should be taught in schools as part of public education. 
It became accepted that throughout the example of beauty, knowledge of the arts could be used to instill values of not only taste, but perhaps more importantly, moral virtue, leading to worthy citizenry that would be productive for the entire nation. There was also much discussion, not only on the civilising influence of art, but also the value of copies in disseminating these ideals. Henry Cole, who, as most of you know, was the first director of the South Kensington Museum, today the Victorian Albert, in his International Convention for Promoting Universal Reproduction of Works, stated that, throughout the world, every country possesses fine historical monuments of art of its own, which can easily be reproduced by castes. The knowledge of such monuments is necessary for the progress of art, and the reproduction of them would be of high value to all museums for public instruction. Of course, here he's talking about the museum context, but of course, it's the same thing in an art institution. Similarly, in Sydney, there was a move to provide public instruction in art with the appropriate models as a civilising influence to the young men and women of the colony. Whilst drawing classes were being offered from around 1843 onwards, however, the art school did not begin to purchase casts until the 1880s and soon had amassed quite a substantial collection. The art department registers of 1910 to 11 show the existence of well over 500 casts and moulds, with numbers, stock numbers that corresponded to those in Bruciani's catalogues for the sale of casts. Among them, of course, were the facial features of Michelangelo's David. Bruciani began publishing his catalogues in the 1840s, but it's quite unlikely that the features of David would have appeared in these early publications. The full-scale copy of David himself was gifted only in 1857 by the Duke of Tuscany to Queen Victoria, and it was installed then in the South Kensington Museum. We also know that Bruciani actually only had access to the casts that were in England at the time and made copies of those. By the public, certainly by the publication of the 1884 catalogue, both eyes, the mouth and nose of David were available for purchase, as was, perhaps more bizarrely, a plaster slab with an eye, nose and mouth embedded into it with both front and side profiles. The catalogues by this stage were oriented towards schools operating under the curriculum of the Department of Science and Art in England and, by extension, schools throughout the empire. By 1891, illustrations were added to the catalogues. The numbering system stayed the same throughout these years. Indeed, it is still the same numbering system that the National Art School casts are catalogued by today. These Bruciani catalogues also list a number of fragment casts of statues from the antique, including the nose and mouth of Caracalla and Adonis, for example, and the eye and nose of the Laocoon. It's indeed interesting that the features of the David are the only ones offered from a modern sculpture. All others are taken from the antique examples. Why was this the case, that the only modern sculpture to be fragmented was Michelangelo's David? The answer, of course, may lie in the 19th century's attitudes towards Michelangelo. There's no doubt that during this particular century, Michelangelo enjoyed a critical acclaim. And this new interest in Michelangelo closely coincided with the development of Romanticism, especially in its emphasis of sublime and strong emotion. It's not surprising then that Michelangelo's work, inscribed as it was with a certain terribilità, experienced a resurgence in acclaim. He became a paragon of the sublime for romantic subjects and expression. His work was well known in Britain, whether through collections of his drawings being assembled by connoisseurs or the many prints made after his works, or by the dissemination of copies. There was even a marble original in London, the Tade Tondo, that the Royal Academy had acquired in 1830. This was, of course, copied by Bruciani and added to his catalogue. His champions actually included the Royal Academy's first president, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who played an integral part in introducing the artworks of Michelangelo to artists interested in romantic ideals. Reynolds helped to popularise Michelangelo through his discourses as the appropriate and sublime artist to model one's work on. And his admiration of Michelangelo is most movingly expressed in his very last of his famous discourses, where he describes Michelangelo as the founder and father of modern art, which, by the divine energy of his own mind, he carried at once to the highest possible point of perfection. Led by the Royal Academy and contemporary pedagogical philosophy, institutions and art school amassed copies of works by Michelangelo 
who became the most revered of the modern sculptors. By the latter half of the 19th century, the South Kensington Museum had quite a substantial plaster collection of his works, including the figures of Lorenzo and Giuliano from the Medici tombs, the Bruges Madonna, the Dying Slave, and of course, the Tade Tondo. All of which Bruciani offered for sale in his catalogues to schools in either full scale or reduction, and many of which the National Art School purchased. But who was responsible for the purchase of these casts, and indeed the choice of them? Whilst early records are missing, certainly the registers of 1910 show that the school was in possession of the eyes, ears, mouth and nose of David in both anatomical and faceted reproduction. And we can surmise from the photo of Lucien Henri in his studio that the Department of Art must have been in possession of some of the casts by the early 1880s. Actually, if you look up onto the right-hand wall here, um, some of the relief casts. The first white one that you come to is actually the cast of the two ears from uh, Michelangelo's David. <clears throat> Lucien Henri, who a few years later in 1883 was appointed the first head of art in, at Sydney Technical College, was a Frenchman and had studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. There had been suggestions that the cast from the 1880s were his personal property. This, however, is highly unlikely. His circumstances before he arrived in Sydney were such that they precluded him from bringing anything as cumbersome as casts with him from France. He was a communard who had been sentenced to a term of punishment in Numia in 1873, and he arrived in Sydney six years later, only after having been granted amnesty by the French government. He would have arrived with very little in his possession. I'm sure that the irony has not escaped you, that the first head of art in a country originally populated by prisoners was himself a convict. Equally ironic, this could be he knocking on the door at the moment, equally ironic, given that we're a society founded on a penal system, was the reaction of the Premier at the time, Sir Henry Parks, on hearing that the communards who were incarcerated on New Caledonia had been granted amnesty. The Premier at this time tried to pass a bill which would ban their entry as there was a fear across the eastern seaboard of Australia of an influx of certain foreign criminals into New South Wales. Despite these fears, the bill was unsuccessful and Lucien Henri arrived in Sydney and established himself as a painter within six months. By 1883, with the permission of the New South Wales Board of Education and on the recommendation of his British counterparts, he ordered a stock of casts. He would have, however, as head of art, also have had some input into which casts were chosen. Whilst Henry was working within a technical education system based on the British model, he strongly advocated studio practice based on European art education and curricula, and having studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, it's quite likely that he chose casts that were representative of his own education and training. I'd like to draw an interesting parallel here from the Frenchman that became the first head of art in New South Wales to one that became the first professor of sculpture and modelling in South Kensington, another French émigré, the sculptor Édouard Glanteri. Lucien Henri and Édouard Glanteri were at the Ecole at the same time, and both in their teaching practice and philosophy were exponents of drawing from the cast, especially the works of Michelangelo. Were they friends at the Ecole? Did they correspond? I'm not sure. But certainly, in the same decades, the two were tenured in pre-eminent art schools in London and Sydney. From 1880 to 1910, Lanteri taught at the National Art Training School in London, which later became the Royal College of Art. The importance of the facial features of David for art education here was cemented by Lanteri. He, of course, followed standard practice and advised his students to model and draw from casts before beginning to model from life. He particularly advocated, however, the use of the cast taken from the face of David for students to copy in clay, beginning with the mouth and working through the nose, ear and eye. This practice conformed both with the tradition of academic training and the national course of instruction, otherwise known as the South Kensington System, instigated by Henry Cole in 1852. In this mode of education, plaster casts were not sharply differentiated from the objects which, from which the moulds were taken. The reproduction was thought to communicate the lessons embedded in the form just as well as the original. 
In many ways, the fragments of Michelangelo's David were acting here not only as synecdoche, parts representing a whole, but also as copy representing the original. Moving from the part to the whole, Lanteri continued to advise the student to consider David as an object lesson in figurative sculpture. He noted that the head and its constituent parts were considered to be both distinctive and unified. Here in Sydney, Henri also advocated the practice. He advised that the students follow a strict program of development and only after they'd begun to show a firmness in drawing from the cast could they progress to a focus on the proportion and construction of the figure and life drawing, very much in the traditional atelier training of an artist. He continued his instructions. Only when the student shows a very decided temperament for figure, then Houdon's écorché, the flayed figure, and Michelangelo are to be drawn at almost every angle. Michelangelo's four reclining figures from the modelling room may follow. His four reclining figures are, of course, dusk, dawn, day and night from the Medici tombs in San Lorenzo. The art school was also in possession at the time of the reduction casts of the figures of Lorenzo and Giuliano as well as their masks. Except for the figures of dusk, the one I have here behind me, the very badly damaged day, and you can see him headless up there on the top corner. Here's his head, which actually stands as a beautiful object unto itself. Uh, and the mask of Lorenzo, which has also been uh, decapitated slightly here. Uh, these are, everything else has been lost, which is very, very unfortunate and have disappeared from the collection. Each of these casts, however, is an object unto itself and has a unique material life all of its own. They are copies, but nothing is a clear duplicate. And one must consider in regard to these casts how that term authenticity relates to objects which are at the same time both copies and original artworks. It's obvious that Michelangelo did not fragment his works, though he did, of course, leave many unfinished, nor did he present them in faceted form. Bruciani, the London formatore, did. If thought of in this way, and by removing the part from the whole, then they become originals. This is, of course, and is not, at the same time, Michelangelo's head of Lorenzo from the Medici tomb. It is a piece by another maker. Michelangelo made the original, which is in Florence. He never produced a mask of Lorenzo, as Bruciani did in the 19th century. Similarly, these are, but are not, the eyes, nose, and mouth of David. They are also, of course, fragments of a whole, caught up in an intricate web of meaning. There's no doubt that in an aesthetic appreciation of the fragment and the fragmentary, each small piece bears meaning not only unto itself, but also through its link to some greater thing. Although this is usually the case in which something has been lost and remains present only via its fragments and the memories associated with them. When we present it, however, with a cast in a fragmented form from a statue that has been deliberately fragmented and not through the ravages of time, then how do we react? In regard to the antique fragment, uh, of course, artists are often left wondering how they would have looked, but here was the 19th century fragmenting one of the most perfect and whole statues in existence, not to mention one that is so alive in the popular imagination that when we look at the Eye of David, it is not hard to imagine the statue known as Il Gigante in the 16th century. The very idea of fragmenting facial features is a bizarre one, it's perhaps something more suited to a modernist mindset, perhaps almost a Dada or surrealist in its intention. The sculpture conservator at the Victorian Albert, Joanna Puisto, writes that Bruciani's cast of David's nose always makes her think of Gogol's story, The Nose. The absurdist account of a nose belonging to a St. Petersburg official found inside a loaf of bread which ends up roaming around the streets of St. Petersburg. Like Gogol's nose, the fragment cast of David's face in the early 20th century here in Sydney took on a life of their own. They replicated and they found their way to other centres of artistic instruction throughout the country. It was via the National Art School that the features of David as well as other casts were disseminated to teaching institutions. As the National Art School was a working art school with its own sculpture department and plaster room, the moulds of these features could be produced 
Now, we do have a huge collection of moulds, and this has quite a lot of ramifications for the collection of the National Art School. The Victorian Albert that had the original Bruciani moulds actually sold off or destroyed their collection in 1955. Uh, the British Museum did buy some of them, but essentially it means that we may have the only moulds, extant moulds, of these particular casts. The school in 1910, in fact, had on hand not only the features of David, but an extensive collection of moulds. And here you actually see uh, two examples. The silicon mould is a much newer one, and the one of the faceted eye is an older plaster and wood mould. During these years, while some technical college, colleges, oh yes, Oh, one minute left. Okay, thank you. I'll rush through it. Okay, so we sold basically a lot of them. The curricula also that um, offered these particular classes grew extensively, and the 1909 handbook here shows. Certainly, through the 20th century, students continued in this particular practice, as we see here from the drawings of Gwen Welsh in the 1930s, and in a drawing class where the students are using the features of Michelangelo's David in the 1960s. Uh, many NAS staff who were students here in the late 60s and 70s, including Noel Fergate, uh, Lynn Easterway, and of course Deborah Beck, who spoke yesterday, recall that during these decades it was still the practice to spend at least six months on these casts before graduating to the life figure. Of course, um, the casts have been much denigrated, but they are experiencing a resurgence. In students' works, some of the master's students and third year students are working with the casts, but certainly, they're experiencing resurgence. And finally, in my very rushed conclusion, um, I can say wholeheartedly that the castaways are in the process of being rescued. Thank you.